Christmas in a Dugout from Tales from a Dugout by Arthur Guy M.P. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christmas in a Dugout As told by a Yank while on a working party to a squad of Royal Engineers in their dugout. You say you fellows have just come out and want to know how I enjoyed last Christmas. Well, I'll tell you the circumstances and let you judge for yourself about the enjoyment part of it. I guess nearly all of you met our guns crew at that show we gave at S, so it will be unnecessary to introduce them. As well as I remember, this is what happened. It was Christmas Eve and cold. Not the kind of cold which sends the red blood tingling through your veins and makes you want to be up and at em, but that miserable, damp kind that eats into the marrow of your bones, attacking you from the rear and sending cold shivers up and down your spinal column. It gives you a feeling of dread and loneliness. The three of us, Curly, Happy and myself, were standing at the corner of Yankee Avenue and Yiddish Street, waiting for the word Stand To, upon which we were to mount our machine gun on the parapet, and go on watch for two hours, with our heads sticking over the top. Yankee Avenue was the name of the fire trench, while Yiddish Street was the communication trench leading to the rear. You see, we were occupying Y sector of the front line of our brigade. The trench was muddy, and in some places a thin crust of ice was beginning to form around the edges of the puddles. We had wrapped our feet and legs with empty sandbags, and looked like snow shovelers on Fifth Avenue. My teeth were chattering with the cold. Happy was slapping his hands on his thighs, while Curly had unbuttoned one of the buttons on his overcoat, and with his left hand was desperately trying to reach under his right armpit. No doubt a cootie had gone marketing for its Christmas dinner. Then came the unwelcome Stand To, and it was up on the fire step for us, to get our gun mounted. This took about five minutes. Curly, while working away, was muttering, Blimey! Christmas Eve, and here I am somewheres in France, half starved with the cold. Happy was humming, keep the home fires burning. Right then, any kind of a home fire would have been very welcome. It was black as pitch in no man's land. Curly stopped muttering to himself, and Happy's humming ceased. There was serious work in front of us. For two hours we had to penetrate that blackness with our straining eyes to see that Fritz did not surprise us with some German culter Christmas stunt. Suddenly Happy, who was standing on the fire step next to me, gripped my arm and in a low excited whisper asked, Did you see that out in front, Yank? A little to the right of that black patch in the barbed wire. Turning my eyes in the direction indicated, with my heart pounding against my ribs, I waited for something to develop. Sure enough, I could make out a slight movement. Happy must have seen it at the same time, because he carefully eased his rifle over the top, ready for instant use. My rifle was already in position. Curly was fumbling with the flare pistol. Suddenly a loud plop as he pulled the trigger, and a red streak shot up into the air as the star shell described an arc out in front. It hit the ground and burst, throwing out a white ghostly light. A frightened meow! and a cat, with speed clutch open, darted from the wire in front of us, jumped over our gun, and disappeared into the blackness of the trench. Curly ducked his head, and Happy let out a weak, squeaky laugh. I was frozen stiff with fear. Pretty soon the pump action of my heart was resumed, and once more I looked out into no man's land. For the remainder of our two hours on guard, nothing happened. Then we turned over to the second relief, and, half frozen, waded through the icy mud to the entrance of our dugout. From the depths of the earth came the notes of a harmonica playing, pack up your troubles in your old kit bag, and smile, smile, smile. Stumbling down the muddy steps, we entered the dugout. This was a regular dugout, not like the two-by-four one we generally had wished on us. Eight boys of our machine-gun section, sitting on their packs, had formed a circle around a wooden box. In an old ammunition tin, six candles were burning. I inwardly shuddered at this extravagance, but suddenly remembered that it was Christmas Eve. Sailor Bill was making cocoa over the flames of a Tommy cooker, while Ikey was toasting bread in front of a fire bucket, the fumes from which nearly choked us. As soon as we made our appearance in the dugout, the circle stood up, and, as is usual with you English, 
unselfishly made room for us to get around the fire bucket to thaw out our stiffened joints. In about twenty minutes or so, the cold of the trench was forgotten, and we joined in the merriment. The musician put his harmonica away, which action was greatly appreciated by the rest of us. It was Ikey. Bursting with importance, Sailor Bill addressed us. Gentlemen, it is now time for the ship's company to report progress as to what they have done for the Christmas feed, which is to be held tomorrow at eight bells. Yank, let's hear yours. I reported one dozen eggs, two bottles of white wine, one bottle of red wine, eight packets of gold flake fags, and one quart bottle of champagne, which had cost me five francs, my last and lonely note on the Banque de France, at a French estaminet. This report was received with a cheer. Ike was next in order. He proudly stated that he had saved his rum ration for the last eleven days, and consequently was able to donate to the feast his water bottle, three-fourths full of rum. We knew he had swiped the rum, but said nothing, because this would help out in making brandy sauce for the plum pudding. Sailor Bill informed us that he had a fruit cake, a bottle of pickled walnuts, and two tins of deviled ham, which had been sent out to him from London. Each man had something to report. I carefully made a list of the articles opposite the name of the person donating them, and turned the list over to Bill, who was to act as cook on the following day. Just then Lance Corporal Hall came into the dugout, and, warming his hands over the fire bucket, said, "'If you blokes want to hear something that will take you home to Blighty, come up into the fire trench a minute.' None of us moved. That fire bucket was too comfortable. After much coaxing, Sailor Bill, Ikey and myself followed Hall out of the dugout up into the fire trench. A dead silence reigned, and we started to return. Hall blocked our way and whispered, "'Just a minute, boys, and listen.' Pretty soon from the darkness out in front, we heard the strains of a cornet playing, It's a long, long trail we're winding. We stood in trance till the last note died out. After about a four or five minute wait, the strains were repeated, and then silence. I felt lonely and homesick. Out of the fire bay on our left, a Welsh voice started singing the song. The German cornet player must have heard it, because he picked up the tune and accompanied the singer on his cornet. I had never heard anything so beautiful in my life before. The music from the German trench suddenly ceased, and in the air overhead came the sharp crack-crack of machine-gun bullets as some Bosch gunner butted in on our concert. We ducked and returned to our dugout. The men were all tied out, and soon rasping snores could be heard from under the cover of blankets and overcoats. The next day was Christmas, and we eagerly awaited the mail, which was to be brought up by the ration party at noon. Not a shot or shell had been fired all morning. The sun had come out, and although the trenches were slippery with mud, still it was warm, and we felt the Christmas spirit running through our veins. We all turned in and cleaned up the dugout. Making reflectors out of ammunition tins, sticking them into the walls of the dugout, we placed a lighted candle in each. Sailor Bill was hustling about, preparing the Christmas spread. He placed a waterproof sheet on the floor, and adding three blankets, spread another waterproof over the top for a tablecloth, and arranged the men's packs around the edge for chairs. Presently the welcome voice of our sergeant came from the entrance of the dugout. "'Come on, me lads, lend a hand with the post.' There was a mad rush for the entrance. In a couple of minutes or so the boys returned, staggering under a load of parcels. As each name was read off, a parcel was thrown over to the expectant Tommy. My heart was beating with eagerness as the sergeant picked up each parcel, then a pang of disappointment as the name was read off. Each of the others received from one to four parcels. There were none left. I could feel their eyes sympathising with me. Sailor Bill whispered something to the sergeant that I could not get. The sergeant turned to me and said, "'Why, blimey, Yank, I must be going balmy. I left your parcel up in the trench. I'll be right back.' He returned in a few minutes, with a large parcel addressed to me. I eagerly took the parcel and looked for the postmark. It was from London. Another pang of disappointment passed through me. I knew no one in London. My mail had to come from America. Then it all flashed over me in an instant. About two weeks before, I had noticed a collection being taken up in the section, and at the time thought it very strange that I was not asked to donate. The boys had all chipped in to make sure that I would not be forgotten on Christmas. They eagerly crowded around me as I opened the parcel. It contained nearly everything under the sun, including some American cigarettes. 
Tears of gratitude came to my eyes, but some way or other I managed not to betray myself. Those Tommies certainly were tickled at my exclamations of delight as I removed each article. Out of the corner of my eye I could see them nudging each other. A man named Smith in our section had been detailed as runner to our captain, and was not present at the distribution of the mail. Three parcels and five letters were placed on his pack, so he would receive them on his return to the dugout. In about ten minutes a man came from the trench, loaded down with small oblong boxes. Each Tommy, including myself, received one. They were presents from the Queen of England, and each box contained a small plum pudding, cigarettes, a couple of cigars, matches and chocolate. Every soldier of the British Army in the trenches received one of those boxes on Christmas Day, as most of you know. At last Sailor Bill announced that Christmas dinner was ready, and we each lost no time in getting to our respective packs, sitting around in a circle. Smith was the only absentee, and his parcels and letters, still unopened, were on his pack. He was now a half hour overdue. Sailor Bill, noting our eagerness to begin, held up his hand and said, "'Now, boys, we're all shipmates together. Don't you think it would be better to wait a few minutes more for Smith?' We all assented, but, soldier-like, cussed him for his delay. Ten minutes passed, fifteen, then twenty. All eyes were turned in Sailor Bill's direction. He answered our looks with, "'Go to it, boys. We can't wait for Smith. I don't know what's keeping him, but you know his name is in orders for leave, and perhaps he is so tickled that he is going to see his wife and three little nippers in Blighty that he's lost his bearings and has run aground.' We started in and waxed merry for a few minutes. Then there'd be an uncomfortable pause, and all eyes would turn in the direction of the vacant place. Uneasiness prevailed. Suddenly, the entrance to the dugout was darkened, and a form came stumbling down. With one accord we all shouted, "'Come on, Smith, you're missing one of the best Christmas dinners of your life!' Our sergeant entered the dugout. One look at his face was enough. We knew he was the bearer of ill tidings." With tears in his eyes and a catch in his voice, he asked, "'Which is Smith's pack?' We all solemnly nodded our heads in the direction of the vacant place. Without a word, the sergeant picked up the letters, parcels and pack, and started to leave the dugout. Sailor Bill could stand it no longer, and just as the sergeant was about to leave, he asked, "'Out with it, sergeant. What's happened?' The sergeant turned around, and, in a choking voice, said, "'Boys!' "'Smith's gone west. "'Some bloody German sniper got him through the napper "'as he was passing that bashed-in part in Yiddish Street.' "'Sailor Bill ejaculated, "'Poor old Smith, gone west.' "'Then he paused and sobbed out. "'My God! "'Think of his wife and three little nippers waiting in Blighty "'for him to come home for the Christmas holidays.' "'I believe that right at that moment "'a solid vow of vengeance registered itself "'in every heart around that festive circle.' The next day we buried poor Smith in a little cemetery behind the lines. While standing around his grave, our artillery suddenly opened up with an intense bombardment on the German lines, and, as every shell passed screaming overhead, we sent a prayer of vengeance with it. As the grave was filled in, I imagined a huge rainbow embracing the graves in that cemetery, on which in letters of fire was written sarcastically in German, Peace on earth, good will toward men but such is war. So, boys, that was my last Christmas. Where I'll be next Christmas, God only knows. Next day my mail came in from America, and didn't cheer me much, because I was thinking of Smith's wife and nippers. So long, boys. I've got to go. End of Christmas in a Dugout